the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome to St. David's worship on this eighth Sunday after Pentecost. Please join with us in the prayers as you are able. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. On the Collect Sunday, the Collect Prayer for this Sunday. Almighty God, your Son has opened for us a new and living way into your presence. Give us pure hearts and constant wills to worship you in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Our readings today are from 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 14, Psalm 89, verses 20 to 37, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 to 22, and Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went on shore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And to wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the Gospel of Christ. I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. There are some in our congregation who love to make puns those plays on words that sound the same but have different meanings. And they make those puns in order to make us laugh. The biblical writers were no strangers to playing with words, although perhaps they did so with a more serious intent. Unfortunately, those sort of word plays get lost in translation, as you might expect. And so it is in the story of David today. David is settled in Jerusalem, a city he has taken for himself and for Israel. He's in a comfortable position, having consolidated his power. He's come a long way from the shepherd boy out in the field, whom the family had neglected to invite the feast 
to the feast when the prophet Samuel came looking to anoint a future king. Now, as king, David's thoughts turn to what he can do for God. See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. So David decides to build God a house, a word that also means temple. Now, it was not uncommon in the ancient world for kings to build a house, a temple for their God, for it showed off the king's wealth and power. The prophet Nathan affirms David's plan to build a house for God. Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. God has clearly blessed King David, so why would God not bless David's plan to honor God with a marvelous house? But that night, God wakes up the prophet Nathan with a message for David. I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? This is a God who's always been on the move, a God of escaped slaves on the move. God reminds David that his success is due to God's initiative. I took you from the pasture, says God, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. It's not David who accomplished these things, but God on his behalf. And instead of allowing God, instead of allowing David to build him a house, God promises to build David, not a house of cedar, but a house as in a dynasty. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, says God, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and he shall be a son to me. God's promise to King David of a dynasty is the foundation of the Jewish hope of a Messiah. The Messiah will be a king descended from David who will lead, protect, and guide the people, just as a shepherd leads sheep to water, pasture, and safety. Sadly, with a few exceptions, the kings who followed from David were a bad lot. They were more interested in their own houses, their own comfort and power, than in caring for the people. And rather than heed the prophets whom God sent to chastise them, they killed the prophets instead. All the while, the people of Israel continued to long for a shepherd king, a messiah. And many recognized in Jesus a shepherd-like teacher and healer, for the power and presence of God were with him and in him. And when Jesus saw a great crowd gathered, he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. In Jesus, God kept the promise made to David. I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come forth from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, 
and he shall be a son to me. Jesus, the shepherd king. The house Jesus builds for God, though, is not a building, not a temple, but rather a people. A people from all the races and tribes and nations. Now, formerly, the Jews had claimed that only they had access to God. But now, writes St. Paul to the church in Ephesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility among us. All now are citizens and members of the household, the dynasty, the family of God, Jews and Gentiles. And then switching metaphors, Paul writes of Jesus as the cornerstone of that house, that temple. Now the cornerstone is the first stone set and all other stones are set in reference to this one stone. In Jesus, writes Paul, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. One commentator writes, the new household of God is not a purely spiritual reality that we visit briefly on Sundays, a weekly time out in which we pretend peace is possible. Rather, the church is the daring practice of a new politics, a different kind of power, the self-outpoured, boundary-crossing power of Christ's cross. As a church, God calls us to be a people united in spite of our differences, united in the love of Jesus. A people whose compassion and love embodies for the world the presence of God. And we are being made into a house, a holy temple, a dwelling place for God, that all may come to share with us in God's peace and love. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us now, by prayer and intercession, with thanksgiving, make our requests to God, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious God, we pray for the renewal of the church in faith, love, and service. We give thanks for the gift of your word, the grace of the sacraments, and the fellowship of your people. We pray for Bishop-elect Stephen, for Dean Alex, for regional deans, Jonathan Crane, Colleen Sanderson, Heather Liddell, Tim Chesterton, and Christopher Cook. And we remember also our parish partner in Bouye Diocese, the parish of Lubanda. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for peace, justice, and reconciliation throughout the world. We pray for the honoring of human rights and for the relief of the oppressed. And we remember, especially this week, members of the Montana First Nation. And we give thanks for all that is gracious in the lives of men, women, and children. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our local community and for all people in the daily life and work. 
We pray for the young and the elderly, for families and for all who are alone. We give thanks for human skill and creativity and all that reveals your loveliness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are in need, for the sick, the sorrowful, and the bereaved, remembering Tim Campbell as he mourns the loss of his mother, Christine. We pray for all who bring comfort, care, and healing. We give thanks for human love and friendship and for all that enriches our daily lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray this week for the community of Lytton, BC. O oh God, you are our refuge and our strength, our help in times of trouble. Have mercy on the lands and communities devastated by fires, and especially the people of the village of Lytton and the Lytton First Nations. Have mercy on those who have lost loved ones, lost homes and livelihoods. Protect those who have had to evacuate. Bless and keep safe all firefighters and strengthen those who seek to rebuild hope that all may face the future without fear. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Let us commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to the mercy and protection of God. Amen. As our Savior taught us, let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Glory to God whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation, in the Church and in Christ Jesus, forever and ever. Amen. And now may God give to you and to all those you love his comfort and his peace, his light and his joy in this world and the next and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. <laughs>